Well, welcome everybody to the 2021 Global Animal Disaster Management Conference. Our next session is Large Animal Rescue, Technical Review of Global Case Studies. Um, you uh, may know, um, okay, first of all, I am Gerardo Huertas, part of the uh, organizing committee and um, uh, in charge of welcoming all of you. I was saying, uh, that uh, in a galaxy far, far away from here, there might be folks that do not know Rebecca. <laughs> Other than that, that doesn't happen often. Um, Rebecca uh, used to work with the US Southern Command, among many other things that she did. I used to work with them as well. And I know how, how professional they are on, on simulations. Uh, it's great uh, to have her here. And as, um, as a biologist, she's a very cool person because all biologists are very cool persons. <laughs> so, um, Rebecca, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I am so glad to be here and you guys have no idea how excited I am to have this global conference after all these years. It's been a dream for many, many people. And I just appreciate the, all the support of everybody that's getting um, this to go. So I'm going to no further ado. Uh, I want to cover a few ground rules first. I've got quite a few slides and um, I've only got 30 minutes. So since this is eventually going to be, since it's recorded and eventually going to be available to anybody, um, I'm just going to touch on some of these things. Uh, we're talking about best practices here and some of the technical details. And we're going to try to stay away from the gadgets. We're going to try to keep it simple. We're going to encourage people to stay out of the way if they don't have any business on the scene. Uh, getting the right people, usually your veterinarian and your emergency responders on the scene. Making decisions. If you got to euthanize it, euthanize it now in the hole. And if you want to practice, then you can get it out of the hole at that point. But uh, don't go through all the, the pain and suffering of a, of a rescue when an animal's not going to be salvageable and euthanize it later. It's not fair to the animal for our welfare. Uh, getting your resources and equipment and PPE in place first. Uh, that's often hard to do when people are saying, do something, do something. But really, we want you to, to make sure your safety is first. Um, that goes back to wearing a helmet. Please wear a helmet. Bring an extra helmet for the people that don't bring a helmet. Um, making an overall plan, that's the hardest thing. People want to jump in and do stuff, but the best way for many of these uh, emergencies and extrications is to come up with a good plan. And then, of course, be will, willing to change the plan. Um, remember the animal is a patient. I am a PhD, not a veterinarian. So you have veterinary questions, you really need to ask a veterinarian, but I can give you some suggestions on what veterinarians have told me over the years. Uh, keeping people out of the kill zone, uh, which basically any four-legged animal has all kinds of ways to kill people, so we want to try to stay out of the way. And then at the very end, um, it's not really the end, we want to get that animal sternal. Eventually, we'll allow the animal to get up or we transport it to definitive veterinary treatment. So those are some of the best practices. Um, the presentation, really, some of the themes here, we're going to talk about animal welfare, we're going to talk about um, incident command, uh, response considerations, and who's in charge, and who's the safety officer, and those kind of things. Uh, human risk mitigation, in other words, how do we keep our people safe? Uh, makes no sense to bring people to a situation and then get them hurt. And then uh, the prevention phase, you know, and generally what you're gonna notice is fence it off. Put a fence around it, whether it's ice or a hole or whatever, put a fence around it. Why are these animals in the situations in the first place? So let's go to our first example. And it comes from Kenya. Uh, some of you that are on the TLR group might have already seen this one. Uh, just happened about a month ago. Rothschild giraffes are an endangered species and they had some flooding in this lake and they decided that they were gonna start moving these, these animals. So what did they do? They came up with a great plan. First of all, they had veterinary oversight. They um, were gonna have to tranquilize the, the giraffes. So they had all the right people. They had the right drugs. They made a plan. They weren't in a hurry. They set up fladry. They they did all kinds of things they need to do because when you bring down a giraffe that's an endangered species and there's only 800 of them left, you don't want to kill it. And so they used best practices. Again, I'm not a veterinarian and I don't do exotics like this, but talking to veterinarians, they say this is a, what you're supposed to be doing. Um, they immediately, after the tranquilization and it's down, they give it a reversal and cover its head, uh, put on the appropriate ropes to be able to control this. And it's sort of like, um, uh, 
one of those jewel wasps that's moving a, a roach. It's the same concept, come here and go there. And it worked great. So this does not work well with equids. I will tell you that veterinarians that I've talked to that work with zebras and horses will tell you that don't, you don't want, to, don't want to try this, but it works well with giraffes for whatever reason. As long as you stay within 12, away more than 12 feet away from their feet because uh, they have such long legs. And they were able to move this animal onto a barge and then move that animal to safety. And what did we get out of that? <laughs> this is in Kenya. And normally those are places that we don't think about having a lot of resources and they were able to pull this off. Um, they pulled a lot of resources together to make this happen. So what can we learn to apply these kinds of concepts to disasters? What do we have? Do we have these kinds of, of things? Basically they made that barge with some flaydry. Um, how could we apply that to some of the animals that we are working with in these flooding disasters? So for every one of these situations, I've got one slide. Again, when you go back, uh, you can take more details on this and notes. But in review, what did they do? They had great veterinary uh, oversight. They had an obvious plan. You can tell the incident commander is coordinating the plan. Uh, they had the veterinarian involved good separate control of the head and body to be able to lead that giraffe to the boat. Um, and then they did excellent patient care. The animal did survive. As an afternote, just a few days ago, they moved the third giraffe out of eight. Um, they decided that the tranquilization was so difficult and, and dangerous that they were just gonna start baiting him into the barge. So they've been feeding him on the barge and last time he walked onto the barge, they shut the gate and they were able to move him successfully. So, you know, if you can do this in Kenya, we ought to be able to do some of these kinds of things, um, apply them to what we're doing as far as disasters. So let's make a move to <laughs> Georgia. I live in Georgia in the United States, and this is one I had nothing to do with this, I'm just going to say. But uh, local fire department that was doing the best they could. Uh, somehow the horse fell down into a stairwell. Uh, people are in all the wrong positions. The animal has obviously been there for a long time. That is blood on the wall from his feet and his head. Um, no idea how long he had been there. Law enforcement shows up, the fire department shows up, and a whole bunch of horse people show up, and that's a veterinarian that's uh, obviously sedating the animal. And they're, again, standing in some of the places I would prefer them not to be. At least at this point, he is anesthetized. Um, but remember, even a a dead horse can kill you, so you got to be careful. Uh, they set up a non-standard version of doing a vertical lift. This is not how we want to do our vertical lifts. Um, these straps can easily slip. Uh, the law enforcement officer that's standing below the load and is doing what with his hand, I I'm not really sure. But again, this is what happens when people aren't really sure what to do, and this is why we want to get a little bit more training out there, particularly for law enforcement and our firefighters, so that we can put them in safer positions. I'm not really sure who's in charge. Uh, that's one of the big problems here, particularly when you're trying to use heavy equipment. Um, however, they did do one thing that was really good. They got it a long way away from the hole because when it comes out of the hole and you set it down and it starts to stand up, it sometimes can fish flop right back into the hole. So um, again, it's not stupid if it works, but some of the things that people are doing here as far as body positioning, et cetera, could be done in a better way. So here's a way to look at that. Um, we'd really like you to use some standard vertical lifting slings and positions. There's a lot of work that's gone into using uh, simple vertical lift slings and th that expertise is out there. Um, and if you don't have it, get with me and I will get it to you. Um, getting good separate control of the head. Uh, the head weighs a lot and they were obviously struggling with trying to hold the head. Don't get under the load. Nobody should be down the hole with a horse. That's a really dangerous place to be. Um, I saw a serious lack of helmets and PPE, particularly on the veterinarian uh, patient care. Um, we often tend to do the extrication and then worry about the patient. That's probably the backwards way to do it. If at all possible, if your veterinarian has access, can you go ahead and get an IV line in there and get some fluids going in that animal while you're trying to get webbing around the horse or whatever? Uh, preferably, one person should be in charge, particularly of the entire situation, and one person that's only the one that's that's directing the heavy equipment. There were several people doing, you know, this and this and those kind of things. That'll get you in trouble. And then, of course, prevention. Let's fence it off. 
If we take a look at these kinds of situations, we see this one a lot. This is uh, an older horse fell down in uh, a muddy stable or whatever situation they're in. Sometimes they fall in between uh, gates or holes, these kinds of things. This is a really common situation that lots of people deal with. And unfortunately, a lot of veterinarians and veterinary technicians have to deal with this as well. Very frustrating, bad conditions. Uh, in this case, they get extra credit for having good lighting because uh, that's really hard to do when you don't have good lighting. I don't like where this person is in the blue jacket. I don't know if she's the tech or who she is, but um, that is, we're gonna talk a little bit about better positioning. If you look to the left, you'll actually see a Becker head protector. So I'm assuming they were getting ready to put that on the horse. That's important to be able to protect the downside eye as well as prevent um, the animal being able to, to get stimulated, particularly after you've sedated or anesthetized it, you wanna protect that. It doesn't have good control of its blink rate reflex and they're making a plan. You can tell that the vet is working together with the local um, fire department and they're just trying to come up with a plan. And in this case, they use some webbing. Um, they did not appear to have a, a tarp or a rescue glide. I would have preferred some of those kinds of things to be used, but it does appear as though people are trying to stay out of the way. They're using some ropes to manipulate legs to get it around obstacles. That's not bad, um, as long as you're not trying to lift with them. However, they were using uh, mechanical equipment. It's not that that is god awful. The problem with this is if something goes wrong, if the clutch slips, if the person um, isn't used to using the equipment very often, uh, if something hangs, like a leg hangs on an obstacle just at the wrong time. And part of that is because winches and mechanical equipment are subject to human failures. So we try to limit that. I'd really like to use a rope system in, instead or a whole bunch of people. There's always a lot of people that are willing to help, but um, just gotta be careful of that kind of stuff. All right. so. Uh, technically, this animal is probably sedated heavily or anesthetized. Uh, they reach down and they grab those legs and it stands right up. So I don't know whether it was sedated or anesthetized at this point. I don't know about the time scale, but please don't let people be in this position. First of all, for ergonomic reasons. Second of all, for kinetic reasons. If you get kicked in the face by a horse's feet, uh, you will never do a technical large animal emergency rescue again, and we don't want you to get hurt. So um, being careful about those kind of things. So again, uh, they look, did a good job of removing some obstacles. It looks like they used some webbing. We much prefer webbing than rope. Um, I would do a little bit of change there with a backwards dab. There's a more standard way of doing using the hips with a piece of webbing instead of trying to wrap it around the rest of the body. Uh, consider a tarp or rescue glide because that produce prevents injury to the body. Um, the skin of the horse or a cow is just as delicate as ours. You wouldn't want to be dragged through that kind of stuff. Um, having separate control of the head. The head and neck weighs, you know, 200 pounds and one per poor person is supposed to be trying to pick that up. That's very difficult to do. You may have to have one or two people to do that. Don't stand in the, some of the positions that they were in and please get some helmets. It, it amazes me how many veterinarians don't have helmets for these kind of things and they do get hurt. So you may not know somebody personally that's gotten hurt, but I do and I know a lot of them. So please put on some helmets. Mechanical equipment is our last choice. Um, if you talk to your local fire department, they tell you all kinds of things about mechanical advantage rope systems and using force vectoring. That's a lot of expertise that's out there to be able to do those things. Um, or you just add more people and that way you've got a little bit better control of what you're doing. Um, if it's really technical, you probably need to be using a rope system because you have a lot more control of um, how much force you can put on the animal. Patient care, they did a good job there. They had a veterinarian on the scene and she was doing her job. Um, do you consider immediate treatment for hypothermia? Hypothermia is one of those things that we see a lot in animals in in all kinds of situations, and it doesn't matter if it's in Florida and it's 70 degrees, the animal's been there in the water long enough, it's gonna be a hypothermia concern. And I'm sure hypothermia was a big concern for the veterinarian for this situation. The animal handler needs to stand up. And we'll talk a little bit more about that after another slide, um, but we are changing the way that animal handlers control down horses. 
and uh, I'll mention that in a minute. Okay, so let's go to the UK. I'm trying to make this a global conference. I'm trying to pull some global examples. This is a recent one in the UK. If you look really close on the right-hand picture, you'll notice some big pieces of steel sticking out of those concrete blocks, and that is a huge potential for injuring this horse. So obviously, whoever was on the scene decided that they were not going to give this horse the chance to really injure himself. Right now, he can't really go anywhere, so they uh, are feeding him some hay, they've got a veterinarian on scene, and they make some um, hard choices. They decide to go ahead and dig down and break the concrete apart, which requires some specialty tools. You're going to lose a little bit of time, but they do have the veterinarian on the scene, and they obviously made that decision um, on scene. Here's some heavy equipment. At this point, obviously, the animal has had to be sedated, uh, probably protecting its ears as well because uh, you want to limit that stimulation. I don't know where the fire department got all this equipment for a little mini track hoe there and, and all that stuff. That's great. Um, that really t requires quite a bit of coordination. And uh, I encourage those of you that are thinking about doing large animal rescue to take a look around at what are your resources when it comes to heavy equipment if you have to use it for uh, opening holes and these kinds of things. Everybody's got their PPE on. Uh, they're using some extensions of their arm. In other words, reach handles. Instead of reaching out and grabbing that hand with your hand, why not use a reach handle? If the animal kicks, you break the reach handle. Who cares? It's not your arm. Um, they're using some webbing. I would modify that a little bit probably with what's called a Swiss seat because that looks like it's getting ready to slip. Uh, technically, they're not doing a vertical lift in this situation. They're trying to do a modified lift and drag at the same time. They're mitigating some of the problems with a tarp, which is great. Um, but again, you know, whenever you've got all these layers of gadgets and mechanical advantage, you, you really have to just take a step back and make sure that your, your safety officer and your incident commander are doing a good job of stepping up. And it looks like they were trying to do that. This guy probably is holding onto the horse's head. It's hard to see from the picture. He's really in the only bad position out of all these pictures. Uh, if that animal flails at this point, um, he could really get injured. So I would have tried to use some tag lines on people that were down in those holes. But otherwise, the review is good. Um, Good use of tarps. Uh, they obviously had the equipment to be able to remove the obstacles. They even put a drainage uh, pump in there to be able to make sure that there was no drainage issues. They used the spreader bar for their vertical lift uh, modified version. Um, again, try the Swiss seat method for webbing. Um, don't forget, we often say, well, it's coming up out of the hole, but they were digging down, and it's possible that you could have just taken that wall out and done a downhill drag. Uh, as human beings, we sometimes get trapped in what we're doing. I wasn't there. I, I'm only looking at pictures, but I would say that that might have often been another option if you didn't have the heavy equipment. Um, thinking about the veterinarian needs helmet, that was one of the first pictures. Um, they need a helmet. Uh, and sometimes you have to bring in a helmet because they may not have one. Um, patient care was very good. There was there early. She provided sedation and or anesthesia and was obviously there for aftercare. It did take three hours to perform this rescue. They made that choice um, to be able to pull in some of the heavy equipment and I don't have a problem with that. If you've got a veterinarian on the scene and they decide, hey, we can do three hours on this, no problem. Um, it really comes down to prevention and fencing it off again. So let's go to New South Wales in Australia. This is in the Hawkesbury, and uh, this it's like 40 degrees C, so extremely hot for those of you in the U.S. And uh, this animal is suffering um, from just from heat exposure. And they go to make this lift out of the situation. Uh, everybody's in PPE except one person, and I'm not sure who that person is. I have a suspicion that it's probably the owner. Um, those folks tend to get a little bit um, emotional and, and close in on what they're doing here. I would have preferred if they'd been a little bit further away and put some helmet on him at, at that point. But, uh, you know, in, in every single one of the pictures, they're, they're doing all the right things. They've got a forward assist on this horse. They're using their rescue glide. Um, I would prefer if the animal handler would stand up. But that guy, <laughs> that guy, whenever, and in the United States, when I, when I see people with cowboy hats, I go, uh-uh. Anytime there's a person with a cowboy hat, don't let them on your scene. Apparently, the Australian bush hat is just as dangerous in Australia. I don't know. You guys can tell me. I'm just laughing. Come on, don't get offended. Uh, I always offend somebody. Anyway, uh, there's the same guy. Uh, 
if that animal wakes up, it's impossible for you to understand whether or not he's actually coming out from the effects of the sedation or the anesthesia. And unless he's dead, um, he can still kick you. Eight, even if he's can still kick you for a few seconds after he's dead. So nice picture of the forward assist. I don't have a problem with some of the things they're doing here. I just would have preferred that they would keep that guy under a little bit better control. So good use of the rescue glide. Uh, that's a piece of equipment that many organizations have and it really facilitates um, safety for the animal and transport for the animal to uh, a better situation. Um, nice with seat uh, would have been awful, awesome, awesome consideration here. Separate control of the head. That head weighs a lot, so you might want to consider having a high point with a pulley to get control of that head instead of people having to stand there and try to pick up 250 pounds uh, or 100 kilos of head and neck. Uh, human safety again, helmets, helmets, helmets. Um, and the animal play handler appeared to be in several bad places. Um, patient care is important. When you get that animal up um, or the veterinarians there needs to treat for the heat exhaustion uh, the on what you're dealing with. The animal handler really needs to stand up. And why do I say that? This is a publication I just did for the American Association of Equine Practitioners back in December. I will make sure that it is available to everyone. I'll send it to Steve Glassy as well. Um, what we started realizing is that when that handler is sitting down or putting the knee in the neck like we all learned, um, that was based on tradition and guys that were veterinarians for a long time. And nowadays what we're realizing is something like 80% of people in the veterinary industry are female, either techs or, or the veterinarians, and they don't weigh as much. They are getting hurt when they're trying to do that. And really standing in this method make it, makes it ergonomically easier on you. You've got better leverage and control, even if you're a smaller person and uh, keeps us safer. So we're trying to change the way that we do things in the veterinary industry with this. And I'll provide more information to Steve. So let's go. We've got enough time for a couple of situations. Here's one in New Zealand. Massey, uh, their university team, went to this one, did a great rescue on this. Using all the right tools, uh, they got all the right people. This is an upside down horse, and this is what we call exigent circumstances. This is a horse that cannot afford to be there for very long. A horse that's upside down in dorsal recumbency cannot breathe very well. They have all kinds of, of challenges, and eventually they will expire. So they understood that and they decided to do a hobbled lift. Um, in this case, they've got their PPE on. They're using their reach handles, um, webbing in the, in the correct places on the legs to be able to make that lift. They're using a spreader bar so that you're pulling all four legs up in, in a normal configuration instead of trying to pull them together. So I really like that, the spreader bar with two to four pull points. Um, head protection, I would prefer, again, that we had a pulley with an overhead to the overhead uh, high point because that poor person is trying to lift that head and neck. It weighs a lot. And if you let that head and neck go too far back, you can actually have some impacts to the nerves and blood vessels and other things that go bad with the bone structure um, if you don't support that head. Um, they did use a mechanical crane in this point, and they needed to. There really wasn't any other way uh, if they didn't have another high point. So good use of their rescue glide. Uh, at this point, the animal's probably still heavily sedated or anesthetized, and take it to a nice place to l allow it to get to sternal. That's what we want. Uh, you don't need to go up and pet it. <laughs> Just let it lay there, give it a little bit of time, and it will get up when it wants to. It wants to get up eventually, too. So. Again, this is an exigent circumstance, very good use of tools and mythologies, um, good use of the spreader bar. Uh, I would work on that separate control of the head and neck. Human safety was very good from PP to positioning to use of reach tools. You could tell who was um, in charge. You had an incident commander and you had a plan. Um, good anesthesia and aftercare. It's a team, they work together and I'm sure they do training together and really comes down to what was it doing there in the first place, fence it off. Let's go to Austria real quick. So this is one of my only one about a trailer. This is a, a horse that just, trailers in general are crap. I don't care what country you live in and we can have that discussion later, but this horse just went forward in the trailer and now he's slipping back down in the trailer. And of course the guy stopped in the middle of the traffic. Um, at this point, we're trying to figure out 
what is our plan to extricate from the trailer. These guys are trying to come up with a plan. Uh, they're setting up their scene safety for themselves as well as for the horse. And they decide to use something simple, uh, backwards drag from the trailer. I would really like it if they had a tarp in here, but other than that, they did a nice job and they do have anesthesia in the animal. They get it off the scene. They have a veterinarian there. They've got lighting. Um, and they, once the animal gets up, they were like, wow, it's really cold. What are we gonna do with this horse? This is their backup plan. I was impressed. I don't think I, I've ever seen a, veterinary, a, a fire department that would do something like this. So very nice job. So they did a lot of good things. They removed the obstacles. They had webbing. They had, uh, you know, maybe use a tarp or a rescue glide, but um, maybe some of their positioning wasn't exactly perfect. They could have gotten kicked. But once the animal sedated, um, they did a good job. And really that comes down to from prevention side, we've got to improve the standards for trailers and floats. And I don't care if you got a $50,000 horse trailer, I'm going to tell you that most of them are not what you think they are. So we're working on that um, outside of this. One more, we got one more time for one more of these. This is Justin and Tori McLeod, some of my peeps in North Carolina, and they got called to this one. This worked great. We had a whole bunch of TLR trained people, including the veterinarians that's had some TLR training along the way with them. And uh, the horse had gotten up in the hayloft. And how it got up there and didn't break a leg, I don't know, but it's up there. And the owner found it and he took pictures and sent it to the veterinarians and they got their team together. They anesthetized the animal. This took a couple hours, but who cares? He can stand there, it's not gonna hurt him. You can give him some water, give him some hay. Uh, they, the whole team worked together to get the horse on a rescue glide. They had to come up with some equipment to be able to pick up something as heavy as a horse. And so they actually have a piece of heavy equipment that's, that's chained to a trailer. They put the horse on the rescue glide with his head protection, uh, manipulated that onto the heavy equipment, brought it back down to level, then pulled the whole trailer out of the barn, and then drove the animal down to the ground level. Beautiful job, okay? Um, First of all, that they asked for photos, so they had an idea what they were looking at before they even got there, so they could be calling for resources. They used a lot of good equipment. Um, they knew what they were doing. They had a great plan, and they even executed it better than the plan. Um, they had a couple of techs and veterinarians on the scene, which is always nice. Um, human safety was good. Excellent coordination between the veterinarians and for patient care. Um, designated to one person was moving the heavy equipment. You could tell who's the safety in the incident commander and it really comes down to why don't people understand that horses will do the dumbest things so fence it off lastly i'm going to take you to czech republic one last thing uh this is tomas and his team in in um, czech republic and this horse goes down into a pool and they had to do a vertical lift out of the control area for the pool and beautifully done rescue nice and safe, everybody's got on their PPE, they've got the heavy equipment that they need. The only person that doesn't have PPE is the veterinarian. Please veterinarians, if you guys are vets, don't get offended at me, just put on a helmet. We really want to keep you safe. That's what, our, what we're trying to do. Did a great job, separate control of the head. They executed the plan beautifully. Human safety was good, uh, PPE and helmets and where they position people and incident commander, it's easy to tell. When you do a good rescue, I can tell who's the incident commander and, and how you're doing these things. And it comes down to prevention. How does a horse and Linda there? If you don't have it fenced off, they will find it. So in conclusion, use best practices. If you need to get a hold of me, we run a TLAR study group. It's not a prayer group. If you say you're going to pray for something, you will get deleted. Otherwise, it's a professional group of about 14,000 people, and it's called Technical Large Animal Emergency Rescue. It's a group on Facebook. And that's my cell and my email if you need to get a hold of me. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, we have a questions and answers uh, feature at the uh, right hand side if you want to pose questions for Rebecca. And we'll also encourage you to use the hashtag GADM conference for Twitter and other social media. Short evaluation will be made available when you exit this session. And just as a reminder, the video recording will not uh, be available until it has been edited and it will be released as part of our GAD Mac Award ceremony in July. 
So, uh, Rebecca, you're up to um, answer a few questions. I am, but I am to this point because Julie Fiedler's on here from Australia, and I brought the wine, baby. We're done. <laughs> So the first question is, uh, we need budgetable uh, uh, TLAR training. Uh, who does that? Who do we call? Absolutely. So there's, in every single country, there are people who are actually doing this kind of training. Obviously, I do that. Um, I've got a whole bunch of colleagues that are doing those kinds of things in countries around the world. And uh, I'm pretty thrilled to be able to say that because we've come a long way, baby. Um, it really comes down to, if you can't find something locally, give me a call, give me an email, and I'll hook you up with somebody. Uh, we also have a whole bunch of things that we've done over the years um, on YouTube and those kind of things. Uh, a lot of people have been concerned about COVID. Yep, Gene Broske uh, wrote about it um, in the answers. Another question is, do you work with zoos on large animal rescues? Okay, some of our folks, we do have some expertise on that. Um, Yvonne's gonna talk later on in the, in the week about some of the zoologic kinds of things. But uh, for example, I've got a peep, his name is Eric Thompson. He's out in Missouri, Kansas area. And they have actually done a lot of work with some of the zoos that are local. Um, they were very successful with a vertical lift of a 19,000 pound elephant. They lifted her a couple of times. She had some serious, um, arthritis issues and that kind of stuff, an older elephant. Eventually they had to euthanize her. But uh, what I tell people is humans are vertical animals. We, you know, we can't understand what it is to be a horizontal animal. But all horizontal animals are basically the same. They have four legs. They're longer than they are tall, unless you're maybe a zebra. I mean, a, a giraffe, but it's basically the same thing. And all the kinds of things that we use for lifting a donkey to um, anything with four legs is about the same. Now, sometimes if you're an elephant, you've got different uh, weapons. Uh, if you're a giraffe, you've got longer legs, but the concepts are the same no matter what. Where you use the lifting um, points, the anatomical features, those kind of things, it really doesn't change. So. Uh, if you need to get a hold of Eric Thompson, you can look him up on the internet um, or you can ping me and I will hook you up with him. Great. Another question. Can you explain about the handler standing? Yes, I can. Hang on. Let me go back up to that picture. So what we started realizing is that the smaller folks, when they're trying to hold onto a horse, um, they are, quote, putting their knee into the neck. But I'll tell you that every single veterinarian and technician that I've ever talked to has told me the story about the day that the horse threw them um, either to the front or the back or the side or whapped them in the face uh, when they were trying to get down with their knee in the neck to hold the horse down. So what we started realizing is if you put your foot in the atlanto-occipital space right behind the ears and put a little pressure there and lift up with the lead rope, as you see in the right hand picture, guess what? you're in a position of having a lot more leverage and control the horse's head. Obviously, he still needs to have his uh, head, head control as far as the blindfold to protect his eyes, those kind of things. But you're doing the exact same thing. You've got a lot more leverage and you can get the heck out of the way because there are some horses when they wake up that you cannot control them. I'm over 200 pounds and I'm a big girl and I'm strong and I have been thrown on numerous occasions by horses that I was attempting to hold down. So um, the one on the left-hand side, you can tell the girl does not have her foot in the exactly the right place. It should be right behind the ears at the atlanto-occipital space to try to hold that down. That gives you all the leverage. It keeps you in, in control of the situation. Great. Yes, somebody Next made question. a comment there. Eric Thompson can be reached through eerulaar.org. There is a question prior to that, Erica. While waiting on resources, what can you do to help animals? Does covering the head help at all when they are panicked uh, or on their sides? Okay, very good situation to ask. Um, depends on the situation. In many cases, if you think about it from the perspective of the animal, uh, when we hear an ambulance, we think, oh, thank God, somebody's here to save us. 
the animal goes, oh my God, somebody's here. <laughs> they don't understand it's there to save you. So sometimes the best thing you can do is maybe throw it some hay and get away. It's amazing to me how many times I've done these rescues or I watch rescues where all these people are standing up close to the horse and the horse is struggling in the hole. And I'm like, hey guys, step back 10 feet. And guess what? It won't struggle so much. What is it doing when it's struggling? It's fighting. It's panicking. It's, it's cortisol levels are climbing. Uh, all those things that the veterinarians are going to get very concerned because it drives the, the uh, animal towards dehydration, colic, and all those other awful things that happen to animals. Yeah, so blocking and sight lines, uh, Penny Lawless is exactly right. So that's why they use tarps and those kind of things sometimes just to protect the animal just from the people because tarps work great to try to um, keep him from, from realizing all these, these predators are staring at him while we're trying to figure out what our plan is. Well, that was great. Thank you very much, Eric, um, Rebecca. It was a pleasure to have you here. The next, uh, the next uh, presentation is going to be about the legal framework for protecting animals from disasters, case study from India. And um, do, uh, do, uh, do come to the other presentations because this is only getting better. Thanks a lot again, Rebecca. Thanks so much for having me.